Hey guys, Alex here. Uh, I haven't worked on Sung's car for a little while just because it's been kind of cold and I didn't feel really motivated uh, just because of the dreary weather, but today has been warmer. This whole weekend's been good actually. So uh, let's get a quick recap of where we're at with the car. I uh, got the wide body behind me. I drove it the yes yesterday, was it? Car drove great by the way. It's a really fun car. So here we are in the shop. We've got Sung's car behind me and just showing you where I'm at with it, right? So. Last time we worked on it, we got the transmission pulled. I did a really uh, in-depth video of how I pull a uh, transmission, including the drive shaft. And I did certain things that avoids breaking bolts or uh, rounding bolt heads off. But unfortunately with the, uh, the exhaust downpipe from the turbo, it's just inevitable that sometimes they break and they did. And it's not a big deal. I'll drill it out and put new exhaust studs in there for the downpipe. Uh, so all is well. Got the uh, transmission here behind me. It's dirty. I think it's leaking from the center section, so I'll have to take it apart and reseal it, no big deal. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and get started on the car as it is and get that motor pulled out and we'll get crack-a-lacking. So uh, here we go, we'll get started. All right, so this is the last place we left the motor at. Um, all we did is we got the, the hood raised, right? We, remember we got the uh, hood struts moved onto a lower perch, which actually puts the uh, hood up at a higher position. That's a factory thing that was done back in the day. Um, we got the oil drained, we got the coolant drained. Um, all, so we, we really didn't do too much motor wise, but again, the transmission has been dropped. We got uh, all the fluids basically drained and ready to go. So there is one thing I forgot to do underneath the, uh, underneath the car when the car was up on the lift, and that is to um, get the, these clips that are holding the bottom um, so I got this top bolt removed, right? And you can feel that there's a little bit of tension because these, these clips are still holding it down in place. So yes, you could just give this a good yank and it would uh, just pull the shroud off from its mounted position, the little clip position. That's okay, nothing's really gonna break unless you're like gorilla gripping it, but you sometimes will lose the clips in doing so. The proper way of doing it is just getting underneath the car and removing the clips. So I'm gonna get this car up in the lift and then we will go ahead and remove those clips and get it back down and we'll get started on pulling the motor. All right, so underneath the car, got the car raised up on the lift. Um, not sure how well you can see in the video, but here's the bottom of the fan shroud and you have three clips total. Now, whether or not this radiator and shroud still have the clips is, is another thing, right? But you have one clip here, one clip here, and there's a third one that's supposed to be up here. And I can tell you just by feeling the third one's gone. That's the most common one to be misplaced. So I'm not terribly surprised. But anyway, you got these two clips right here on the bottom and you just simply, you just pull them down with your fingers and you can use a screwdriver, a pair of pliers, and that's all there is to it. But it looks like the other one's missing too. So we only had the one clip, which is fine. It's, it's better than it not having a clip, but you can still get these clips brand new, which is not you know a point of concern at this point, but uh, good to go. We'll go ahead and lower the car back down. Um, actually, you know what, take that back. Now that we're underneath the car, let's get the motor mounts uh, loosened up, right? Because we're here now. So let me, uh, let's walk over here. Actually, let's go to my, my tool cart. I left it exactly where we last left off. Now, figuring if the, if the, uh, the bolts or the nuts on the motor mounts are a factory, there should be a number 14. And I think that my impacts are probably in the drawer still. Um, let me go get my other impact gun, not the big guy. Let's use the small one here. So we get this guy, we'll take off non-impacts. And let's see, where's my number 14? Not here. Uh, well, I might have to put the camera down for a moment while I find my, oh, there it is. All right, <laughs> give me give you that some advice, keep your tools organized. All right, and what I usually do, is the this length of a extension is good enough to reach up there so let me go find my adapter to go from three eighths to half inch which i believe is in the drawer all right i was probably just looking at it earlier which i was okay so adaptered up and let's go ahead and get those motor mounts loosened up. All right, so again, not sure if you can see, 
but they got two motor mounts in this car. Uh, unlike the Z32 or even you know newer vehicles like the Xterra VG series, they have the Z31 VG30 only has one nut per motor mount. Later ones will have two nuts per motor mount, but it's easy enough, obviously, to get that out. So, all right, that's one down. And my socket came off, no big deal. All right, let's go put this where it needs to go. All right, let's get the next one. So on the turbo cross member, let's talk about that for a second. Turbo cross member on this motor mount positioning, this is the same between non-turbo and turbo. But on the turbo cross member, the motor mount is on the flip side of the member on the forward facing. And that's simply because it needs to provide room for the turbo mounting, which is where the motor mount would be on the non-turbo. So conventionally, when you do a NA2T, a non-turbo to turbo swap, you would need to procure one of these uh, turbo cross members or run a different exhaust, custom exhaust setup where you replace your turbo elsewhere. But that's another conversation later. So notice at this point, right, there's no transmission. There's no bottom stud nuts holding the motor mounts, but right now it's just gravity keeping the motor at bay. And the motor is not gonna fall out backwards. The, the firewall is gonna what's hold it in with you know, the heads and the exhaust intake and all that fun stuff. So not terribly worried about it at this point. Like I said, I've been doing this for a while and it's just how I do it. So, okay, let's go ahead and get the motor dropped. I'm sorry, the car lowered so we can pull the motor out and we'll get cracking on this. All right, car is back down. And like I said, we just got the clips removed so we can go ahead and pull this out. And what you do is just kind of shimmy it to go past the fan blades and, and it's as easy as that. You're not really worried about scarring anything or breaking anything. So because I'm kind of trying to keep things organized here, let's go ahead and put this in the pile with other parts. All right, also let's get the tool cart and bring it back around. Put this guy in there. Okay. Gotta love it when stuff falls off. All right. impact right here for now while I'm dropping everything it seems like all right so basically there's only about three things uh, in, in terms of subject of what needs to be removed at this point or maybe four things we got radiator hoses front and heater hoses in the back we got a fuel line and then we got miscellaneous vacuum lines and then we have the obvious, the electrical stuff. That's the high level stuff and in addition to throttle cables. At that point, pretty much everything's ready to come out. So um, let's go ahead and get busy, get cracking at it. Um, I kind of work in progression from, I'll do obvious front stuff, then I'll work on one side and then move to the other side, not to cause a massive explosion of, you know, things flying as far as parts and disconnecting and whatnot. So, Let's get the, the radiator hoses done first and we'll get moving on to the passenger side and then switch to the driver's side. So, you know, there's things like this. Um, we got vacuum, or I'm sorry, yeah, zip ties here that we're replacing the twist lock, uh, the twist component ties that are very common for those to break. So let's get that snipped, a pair of dikes, and that's good to go. Might as well get these. This is the overflow hose. And you know, when we're redoing all this stuff, I will go ahead and uh, inspect the condition of everything. Most likely all these lines will get replaced, including these upper radiator hoses. I'm assuming in this case for this car, just because of everything that looks original, that a large portion of these hoses are probably original and not worthy of going back in the car. So you got these types of, uh, 
hoses there and vacuum lines and sometimes I give a good snug to see if they come off and they're not. They make a special pair of pliers and you'll see that I have a mix of good tools and Harbor Freight tools. Ain't nothing wrong with some of the basic tools from Harbor Freight. So if you see this has the circular grips to the end of it, you use that in twist. You don't pull, you twist it. And that breaks the seal. So there are, you can just pull them out like that. And I honestly don't care about vacuum lines. If they need to be cut off, that's fine because that's a good, uh, good enough to replace them anyways. Um, if you notice, notice I kind of just shove things out of the way. All right, so we got the got the carbon canister vacuum um, vacuum lines removed. We got a other vacuum line removed. Let's go ahead and get the upper radiator hose removed. Good old flat blade screwdriver. That'll do it. And I could use a nut driver, which you know makes things easier sometimes. And you notice there, I didn't pull, I twisted. And then once I noticed the seal was broken, I then give it a pull. Sometimes if you pull without breaking the seal, you can uh, damage hoses and whatnot. So I don't like how this is in there. It's kind of wedged. So let's get that out of there. All right, so we'll give this a good twist to break the seal. And this one's... Man, that's on there pretty good. Um, I don't have a pair of pliers big enough for that per se, but I do have some channel locks so it kind of simulate the same thing. So you get your pair of channel locks, you get a good grip on it, and you give it a good twist like this. And you can hear the rust from the seal breaking. Wow, that was on there pretty good. This hose is not, I don't think it's original. It feels a little bit thicker than the hoses normally feel like, but here regardless, we gotta take it off. There, you just heard the click. All right. Yeah, so if you look at that, you can set rust and grime. Sometimes in doing so, this fitting right here gets rotted away. It looks all right. So I'll probably just sandblast it, put it back on. All right, so we got the lower radiator hose, and that one appears to have the original hose clamp down below. Let's get a flashlight for that so you guys can see. And let's get my number 10 speed drive. All right. Okay, so let's find a clever spot. How about the crank dampener here there okay so let's see if you guys can see that all right sorry that looks like the flashlight just dropped a little bit sorry about that it was the fan that kind of pushed it out of the way there we go And yeah, you could have, you could have got this one um, loosened and removed when you were under the car. It really doesn't matter. It's just whatever, whatever's clever. And I have a bag of these actually, of these newer clamps. Of these, uh, I'm sorry, not newer clamps. I have a new bag of these original OEM clamps. So we'll put these in the trash and put new OEM clamps back on. Man, that was, the threads of this is really nasty because it's not going loose by hand at this point, which it should. Okay, all right, I think we got it. Okay, so that one's loose now, if you can see, right? I got this out. Now on the earlier cars, like the 84 through 86, I've noticed that the radiator I think it's thinner wall down here, the original radiator, because almost every time I get that off, I end up bending that and getting it out of round, like every time, if it's an original radiator. So, it's just one of those noteworthy things. 
All right, so got the front radiator stuff off. Um, we'll go ahead and start working our way that way towards the uh, passenger front to the firewall. So since I'm right here in the front, let's get the fuel line off. Car hasn't ran in some time. So the statement at that point is there's, the fuel line's probably not pressurized. So I'm not worried. And one thing I'm noticing right away, adjust the camera, this screw was super loose on the clamp. So that kind of tells me that either the hose is shrink or they didn't put the right hose clamp back on or whatever. So just taking notes here, I have new fuel line clamps. We'll put those on. I'm going ahead and get the other one loosened up. All right. So th same thing as before, you really don't wanna destroy things in the process. So you just work it back and forth. Now, I know from experience that this line typically gives a fight on the way out. So I generally work it back and forth while I'm pulling on it, because it typically does. So we get that tucked away. Let's go ahead and get the other one. Same thing. Uh, this one, hose clamp looks kind of messed up. Yeah, hose clamp is pretty much done. It's all warped and not happy. All right. So I've got that loosened. And boy, that's not coming off easily. Let's get some of this, this hose clamp out of the way. All right, yeah, so this one's gonna put up a fight that I expected the front one to do. So again, get the uh, pliers on it. And while twisting, actually this one hasn't broken the seal yet. Yeah, this one's done for. It's not coming off. It's starting to starting to crack. It's an older older hose. It's okay. We'll just replace it. Most of these are probably gonna be dry rotted anyways. All right. All right. Got that one out. Like the others, we'll just tuck it out of the way. Just probably put a kink in it. And Shove it down in there. Okie dokie. Um, so like I said, we'll just start working backwards here from the front of the engine bay backwards. Um, I'm debating, yeah, I'll probably pull the power steering pump and the AC as, as one entire assembly. Um, I, I don't know the condition of the fluid. I don't know the condition of the, the charge in the AC. So it makes no point trying to preserve anything. Everything, everything needs to be flushed out anyways. So with that said, I'm trying to think here of my angle of attack. I will remove the, uh, the top feed there to the oil pump and its supply line, but I'll wait till the last minute because it's going to make a mess. So we'll just hang out on that for a moment. Um, let's go ahead and uh, get the cruise control line off. The uh, throttle cable there for the cruise control. And what I do is I simply just remove, let me adjust the camera, the bracketry here. That way the lines don't lose their adjustment. And if that needs adjustment, I'll adjust it after everything's back in the car. So for right now, I'll just pull off the brackets and get the lines out of the way. Like so. All right, so we get that out of the way. Move that guy. And then I just put the, uh, the screws back in their little home here. That way we can get back to them later.
Okay. We're going to keep the number 10 around because that's going to be used a bit as well. Okay, so we've got cruise control. Go ahead and place it up there on the cowl. And what I'm doing right now, guys, is I'm, I'm taking a little bit of inventory here, just reviewing what's in front of me. Like, for example, we got this broken EV1 type connector, so that'll have to be replaced with a new one. It's not a big deal, but it's worthy of notating. And I'm just trying to see what else I should grab. Let me get a number eight socket for some of the hoses. And we'll do a shallow. Okay. And might as well grab a universal joint as well. It's for the rear heater lines there. Okay, so let's get the harness loose and get the harness ready to be removed. There is a 10 millimeter head uh, nut or bolt behind this loom. Let's get the camera adjusted. Sorry. And typically it'll stay with a little clamp there, which it is. I'm going to go ahead and just get it threaded in there a bit more. So I don't have to worry about it losing it. And right next to that clamp, there is a ground to the plenum. So let's get that one out. And, you know, I could be using an impact. I have a tiny one, but when I'm working on a motor or an intake or anything that I haven't touched before, that I don't know the integrity of some of the threads, I like to feel by hand to see how it's doing in terms of its overall uh, status. So it's interesting. This is normal. I've got two 10 head uh, screws here or bolts, but back here we have a regular Phillips and that's normal. That's how it is on factory. It's not like, you know, they just put a random bolt in there. So this is actually how it's supposed to be. That's good to see. All right, and I'll just set this aside here for a moment. Um, so one thing you guys might be harping on me right now is I'm setting tools up here. I'm getting my screwdriver wrench over here. Yes, I do have the fender guards, but this whole car is gonna get repainted. I, I think it's perfectly fine to be uh, kind of leaning into it and putting the tool right here. This whole car is gonna get painted, guys, so don't criticize me too much. But we'll go ahead and uh, continue on here. All right, so um, this is a, the distributor, the CAS signal right here, crank angle sensor. Very normal for the connectors tabs to be broken. That tells me this distributor's been pulled out before. And this is a CHTS connector right here, the two prong black connector. Um, it's also been pulled out before as well. It's broken. Again, it's very normal. And then you have the fuel temperature wire, just the camera, fuel temperature right there. It's a reference signal. It just tells the ECU what the temperature is. It, it's not critical, it's just reference. So go ahead and pull that through. And it looks like they. The connector breaks all the time, so they just simply put a spade connector on there. So, and they, meaning previous owner, trying to figure out why they got the wiring as routed as it is. Okay, so let me get my flashlight. Let me show you the coolant gauge temperature sensor. And just got a needle nose pair of pliers to pull that guy out. All right, so let me adjust the camera. So if you look down there, let me adjust it one more time. So straight down there, that's the coolant temperature sensor. That's for your uh, gauge on the cluster. Um, the sensors usually don't fail. They're pretty resilient. As a matter of fact, the one that's in my 89, I'm pretty sure, you know, that car having 260,000 miles, I'm pretty sure that's the original sensor. They just, they typically don't fail unless you break them accidentally or whatnot. All right, so next is this EGR uh, solenoid there. All right, so all that's left on this side at this point is 
the fuel injectors. Now, there's a million ways you can pull those off, the little clips that retain the connector, but I like to do it in a very specific manner so that I don't lose them. And I use picks. You can use a flat blade if you would like, but the flat blade tends to like spring load them out of there, so you end up losing them. So what I do is I get a magnet like this guy right here. I put the magnet right next to the, the uh, fuel injector connector, which is, these are EV1s by the way. And I'll uh, keep it close to it. And then when, then when I pull it off, it'll just hopefully catch it with the magnet. And then you put the uh, clip, the spring clip back on the connector before you install it again. That's how it's supposed to be done. Modern cars will have the finger press release so this one's going to be hard for you guys to, to see in the camera, I, I think, but um, normally I wear like a headlamp or something to give me my light that I need, but I'm just going to use a flashlight for now. Let's see if I can sneak it behind it. There we go. It's good enough. All right. So like I said, there is a little, let's see if I get the camera. Um, there's a little, there's two areas where you can get a pick in there and pull. Either one's fine, but what I do is I go, if I'm pulling the pick on the left side of the connector, I'll have the magnet on the right side of the connector. That way I catch it, right? So get the magnet right next to it like that. Hope you can see. And then you go ahead and use your pick and you give a good separating and it looks like the clip dropped, which is fine. I, I can see it. We'll go ahead and try it to the next one. It's, you know, it's, it is what it is, guys. Sometimes you lose them. Um, there's actually a guy on eBay who's been making these clips or sells them. And you can always buy your clips, but chances are I can just, once the motor's pulled, I'll look for it and get it later. So pull the clip out like so. This one's kind of being a little stubborn. I think the magnet's kind of messing with me. There we go. So that's how I usually um, get them out. I just set it aside. And then once the whole engine's pulled out, then I'll put them back on the harness. So the, the number five injector, so it's one, three, five, and two, four, six. Um, this one's kind of a pain because it's kind of underneath some emissions stuff here but i'll try my best to get you guys to capture this so same thing get your pick in there get your magnet ready and give it a good tug got it so this one i got there we go so that's how i pull these out the other one is right next to the, uh, the actual injector sitting on the bottom of the lower intake. Okay, so let's turn off the flashlight. All right, so let's review all this. So now that we got that removed, go ahead and just gently pull up the connectors. There's a good, good chance, unfortunately, that the connectors could be brittle and it could break if you pull at them or look at them wrong. So it's best to get your fingers on the connector and pull with the connector. Don't tug on the wire because you don't want to pull the wire out of the connector. Otherwise you'd be soldering a new connector on there. Okay, so where are we at with this? Got some loopage going on. Okay, so we got the passenger side uh, harness out. Now, one thing I forgot to mention to you guys, um, the Z31 EFI, the uh, electronic fuel injection, the, there's, it's bank, it's batch fire, right? So it's bank to bank, bank to bank. You, you don't have to technically uh, label these as far as like one, three, and five, but you can see how clearly they were, you know, the, like the wiring has been held in such a way for so many years. But I mean, it really doesn't matter. You can go like this way or that way. It's still gonna work just the same. Um, obviously you can't do those spark plug wiring, but but it, on the Z32 and even the M30 and, and you know Pathfinder Xterra's in the 90s and so on, um, they have sequential fire. 
So they have six individual injector drivers for the, uh, the fuel injection. So it's at that point, yes, it is important that you have it on the right connector and the right injector. But because the Z31's batch fire, it doesn't matter. Um, so you can just pull it off and don't worry about labeling it. Um, you can be, you know, detail oriented if you'd like to label it. That's completely your choice. But again, I've been doing this for so long. I know where each one goes. Okay. Um, so you got two heater hoses, right? In the back, you got a, you got a feed and a return. Um, so one of them is easy to get to, which is right here. I'm pointing right at it. The other one's kind of back there. Now, the easiest way that I've learned to pull it, that, that line back there is not to mess up your arm and your hand scratching it up. Because the motor has no transmission and because it's ready to be pulled essentially, you can actually like tilt the motor forward and you'll be able to get to that one much, much easier. So that's what we'll probably do um, is get that over there. But let's go ahead and get that one, uh, that accessible heater uh, hose disconnected. And so that's gonna be a eight on the smaller Nissan OEM clamps. And let me get the flashlight down there so you guys can see. And I can't read through, remove some of the janky, you know, ghetto wiring that the previous owner did. It's okay though, as long as I can clearly see what they were trying to do and I'll just reverse it and put things back to factory. All right, so we got that loose and same thing applies here. This one actually looks like it's in good health as far as the overall condition of this um, hose clamp, but we're gonna replace it anyways, just because I see a little bit of rust. Okay. And what's interesting is that Nissan's been using this uh, nut driver type of uh, clamp for a long time. Like you'll see it, it, you know, as early as like 280ZXs and throughout like the 90s. I'm pretty sure my 2001 Xterra has some of those clamps in various spots. They also have like those spring-loaded ones, like the Z32 has a mix of those spring-loaded clamps, but also these traditional uh, screw and nut driver types. So I'm just simply pushing off the clamp. Um, so let's get my largest uh, hose pliers to give it a good twist. I think the largest one I have will be perfect this guy so you just get it on there and you give it a good twist if you don't have these pliers use like channel locks use a regular pair of pliers don't use needle nose pliers try to find a pair of pliers that has like a round curvature to it because you're gonna tear it up otherwise all right so this one i kind of expect once i pull it off it might leak a little bit cool it that's okay it's coming off. Get the flashlight kind of situated there. All right, no leak, that's good. Okay, so that one's off. And the other one's like right above it, right next to it, but it's behind the motor, like I said, so it's just easier to tilt it. But let's do a quick check here on what needs to be removed. We got a vacuum line up here on the top of the intake. This one normally breaks because it's right above the exhaust and it's brittle, but it actually came off. That's kind of cool. Oh, that's because it did break and they just put one on top of it. That's why. Okay, so fuel's off. Got one heater hose disconnected. They got the electrical disconnected. Um, all that's left to do on this side is to get the uh, is to get the power steering hose disconnected and like I said I will do that very last minute because it's going to be a mess and I just don't want it accumulating all over that side of the car so let's get my tools we will leave the little clips there because that's just a good home for it temporarily and let's get going on this side as far as disconnecting things okay so let's get the carts. All 
Obviously there's more stuff on the side. You got AC compressor up top, which is kind of annoying that sits there like that. And you got the intake down here, which we'll need to disconnect. Um, but we got electrical stuff right there. And obviously the fuel injectors. There's a lot of turbo related uh, vacuum lines and coolant lines, but a lot of that comes out with the motor, which makes it super easy when you're replacing some of those coolant lines for the turbo. And here is the O2 sensor. We'll go ahead and unplug that since we're looking at it. So let's go ahead and get some of the vacuum lines, some of the top easy stuff done. Um, and again, vacuum lines, I don't care to retain them or save them just because they get replaced anyways. So let's get, so they're on the intake. There are two grounds to it. And this is 84 through 89 non-turbo or turbo. You get very uh, familiarized with the location of the grounds. Um, I've seen and worked on these where, a, you know, an owner will have replaced the motor or whatever, and it's just not running right for whatever reason. And it turns out that they didn't have the grounds. And it's a very, very uh, common thing. So seen it a bunch of times. So we'll put the uh, screw back in its home. All right. Okay, so taking a quick inventory like I did before. Oh, here's something interesting. Check this out. So this right here looks like two cut wires, right? But this is how it is during the fuel injector safety, voluntary safety campaign. It's not a recall, it's a safety campaign, but a lot of people refer to it as a recall. And what they do is, I said, I mentioned earlier that there are only two injector drivers on this car. That's very true. If you open the ECU, there's two injector drivers. They're green little bricks. They look like Lego bricks. Um, but they had three wires uh, going to each one. And I, I believe because there's too much resistance on having three wires run to a single injector driver, it caused the injector driver to, it caused a solenoid within the injector to get too hot and can cause a engine fire. So Nissan said, okay, well, being that there's only two injector drivers, one per side, um, we'll just snip and clip all the injector wires and just merge them all to one. And that's essentially what you see here. So uh, so all I'm saying is this car had the safety campaign performed on it by the factory. So that's good to see that. Um, so this device right here is the AA auxiliary air control valve, AACV or whatever it's called. Um, looks like to be in good health. But I, you know, what these will do over time is that um, carbon buildup and oil buildup will get inside this thing and cause random idle issues. So I always take them apart and clean them. They're serviceable. You just gotta replace the gasket and that's it. There's really nothing that can fail on them unless they're like beyond the point of cleaning, which I honestly haven't seen too much of that happen. Okay, so check this out some kind of rigging here. Like on the fuel injectors, you got those little C-clips that hold those uh, connectors on. At one point, for whatever reason, it broke on this guy's car. So he had <laughs> the wiring from it kind of just on there. Um, whatever, I have new TPS connectors all soldered on, but it's kind of disappointing to see that. All right, so all that's left to do are the uh, the fuel injectors. So just like before, let's go review them. Oops, flashlight's freaking out. Got one, two, and three. So they're all there, intact. And just kind of move things out of the way. Um, go ahead and just temporarily unplug the distributor wires. Okay, so let's get my pick and the magnet and do the same thing. Got it. So you check that out. You're not losing those if you do it right. Set that aside. All right, where's the other guy? This one's kind of hard to get to because it's kind of below the, the uh, 
idle valve. So I'm not sure if you'll be able to see me do this. I don't know where my longer pick went, so I'll have to kind of struggle with this one. I had bought a longer pick just to do this. It makes life a little easier, and I have no idea where it went. That's okay, it's almost out. Got it. One more to go. I feel like I'm performing surgery or something. Okay, got that one out too. Check that out. Okay, got those out. Those are, some people struggle with those. Okay, so. Just like I said before, do a very gingerly pull of the connectors because they do end up breaking. One looks good. Let's get this one over here. Get that one out. And the last one, I'll, I might have to hire a flat blade screwdriver to kind of it out if it'll let me. Nope. Top hat of the injector connector came off for a second. All right, I'm just gonna get a pair of pliers. I don't want to fight it. It feels like these have like never come off before, but obviously they have. All right, got it. Okay, so got that off. That takes care of almost all the electrical. Let's just kind of snake it out. Sorry, fighting the camera here. I just reviewed the battery on the GoPro. It's running low. I'll have to switch the battery here in a minute. This GoPro is kind of chew through batteries. All right. So, again, shame me all you want. This car needs a new paint job. So I'm not terribly concerned about how I pull the wireness out and where I land it. So we'll go ahead and put the uh, wires back on just for consistency. All right, so cool, check this out. This is the AC compressor. Um, this is the clutch engagement wire. And I saw just a moment ago that it was broken right here. So I'll have to source another connector for that. And then, so this wire right here is an isolator ground wire. It helps reduce uh, electrical feedback. Um, the, honestly, it really doesn't do anything um, in terms of um, reducing any wind in the alternator. Um, so the coil for the distributor is right here, right underneath the uh, low pressure line of the AC. So just scoot it off and I usually just kind of just kind of tuck it in there um, unfortunately like you'll see these break all the time get the camera adjusted these little ball um, ties they just do that it is what it is um, okay so I need to go change out the battery on the GoPro and then we got a few more vacuum lines to disconnect actually let's go do that right now before I get too distracted with batteries. Um, so we got some of these spring locks on these lines. Okay, and like I said, we're just gonna give them a good tug because I don't care to retain these. But yeah, that one's not coming. That one's not coming, so. Let's 
give us some motivation, shall we? Okay. Sorry. That one's off. Uh, you can hear the crack of the seal of the line rupturing. Okay, so what we got going on down here is we got this uh, these vacuum lines and I, I'm happy to see what I'm seeing here. We got the routing of the vacuum lines. They come down and they swing against the um, intake right here, the intake piping, and it swings underneath the compressor via zip ties, and that's all factory. So this, those have never been touched. And it's like a good thing and a bad thing, right? Because it means that the car's never been serviced in such a way, but it also means I don't have to like undo someone's mess. Um, so I'd rather undo I'd rather uh, replace old original lines and undo someone's mess. So what I'm gonna do in this case, I'm not gonna try to reach my hand under all this stuff. I'll get the motor pulling out and there's a couple of things that disconnect. Like for example, we still have the alternator over there that needs to be disconnected. I don't pull off the alternator wiring until it's like out of the engine bay a little bit because there's enough slack in the line until we can do that and you don't have to like mess up your arms or you scratch your hands or whatever doing that. And same thing with right here, there's stuff to disconnect when it's halfway out. So that's how I do it. Um, but let me go change the GoPro battery and we'll be right back at it. All right, got the battery replaced. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is um, get the low pressure and the high pressure of the AC uh, disconnected and just pull out of the way. So we're gonna pull the entire motor with both the power steering and the AC compressor. Um, so let's first see if there's anything in there before we do that, I have a can I can use to evacuate the, any charge in there. Um, I have no idea if, if there is anything in there, I have no idea if it's R12 or R134A, um, because we don't know if, again, the previous owner just went to AutoZone and filled up at random. So even if there is anything there, I'm not gonna retain it. I'm gonna, cap, I'm gonna evacuate it and keep it for a proper disposal. Um, so what I'm gonna do right here, there's a little push pin like, you, like a tire valve uh, stem in there. I'm just gonna push it to see if there's anything in there and we'll find out. And I like, it's nothing in there, it's empty. So, cool. Um, let's just test the, this. Sometimes there's an unequal amount of pressure because of uh, the filter in the dryer. Same thing, okay, cool. Um, as I just dropped one of these, I was about to say that these caps are kind of hard to find, the original caps. So I'll have to pick up the one I just dropped, but try not to lose those. Um, you can't get them anymore. So if you're going for a complete restoration, which is what we're doing for this motor, it's kind of important to have those. Um, like I said, I can, I can kind of see it. I just dropped it, my bad. It's right there, I'll just pick it up real quick. Let me get my other pliers. Dokey. All right, like I said, um, those are kind of hard to find in good shape. So just try not to lose those. All right, um, so these are 12 millimeter heads. And before we go over there, we got a the brake booster vacuum over here, the feed for the brake booster. And I always do this, check this out, to see whether or not the hose is healthy, which it generally never is because it got a lot of heat soaking right there. This hose is like, like plastic at this point. It it's clamped, but it's it's like spinning. Check that out. So the hose needs to be replaced 100%. Um, it's not creating an airtight seal at that point. Man, this feels like like plastic. I'm gonna break this just to show you guys how bad this is. Ready? Let's see if I can break it. Yeah, check that out. It's like plastic. Okay, but. You get the point. So with that said, I usually just kind of spin it out of the way because it's literally like plastic. Um, so while we're right here in this area, I have an NOS brand new uh, washer bottle I'll put in here. It's white, it looks, it's like brand new. Um, and then we'll replace the master, which is, these caps are never yellow, usually. This is a, this is a Nissan OEM, but it's not the original. So at one point the, the brake master was replaced, which we'll do again. And then the uh, slave is down there. Um, unfortunately, you can't get the slaves anymore for the Z31. 
Um, the 240SX is exactly the same minus the push rod and the Z32 is exactly the same as Z31. So if you can get a 240SX, either S13, S14, or Z32, you can make it happen, which is what we'll do for him. Um, so just again, I'm, I'm just reviewing things, seeing if there's anything, any other gotchas before I snap this off. But it looks like we're at that point now. And then what we'll do after that, after this is removed, we'll tilt the motor forward because we have the heater hose behind the motor that we have to get to yet. Um, so let's get my number 12, which I honestly thought was in here, which it is. And let's also get my impact driver. Same thing as always, um, put the uh, bolts back where you found them type of deal. That way you don't scramble to find them if, you're, if you drop them or put them in a bag or something. And you have to be careful with these lines, they're O-ring fitted on the bottom. Um, so you don't want to mar either the line that goes in or the seat right here. So just gotta be careful with this area. And that's actually a good thing about putting these bolts back in because if you notice, it's like preventing things from touching. So just a kind of a little trick there I do. All right, so before we tilt the motor forward, we have to get the intake piping off. Um, so we have the mass airflow, it's right here. We got a vacuum line that just popped off because it's like incredibly loose and brittle. And then we have a spring clamp. This line is for the air pump that pumps cold, fresh air into the catalytic converter for a rapid uh, warm up. If you're curious to know why is there a vacuum line pre mass airflow, well, that's because this is not meant for engine operation. And that thing is definitely seized on there, nice and tight. So let's go ahead and get my hose pliers. Oops, caught my thumb in that. And I'll go ahead and crack this if we can. This one normally fights me just like it is now. is on there. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to go ahead and loosen the uh, number eight clamp there. So that way we can just pull the entire fitting off. Use my speed, speed wrench to get it off. Okay. Feels loose, let's see if we can pop it off. Man, it's it's putting up a good fight, tell you that. It's it's coming down. There it goes. So if you look at that. <laughs> it's a 90 degree uh vacuum nipple there but it's like like a 45 degree joint <laughs> old school that's how it was though all right um so in terms of pulling the motor um i usually leave the mass airflow in there but in this case because we're going to be probably pressure washing the engine bay getting her paint it'll come out um, but I might, just kind of thinking out loud here, whether or not I want to pull the mass airflow right now. And I probably will. 
Um, looks like the, is the wire connector thing on there still? I can't tell. It has this connector for the mass. Yeah, it's, it's already been pulled. Usually it has a spring um, clip on there, just like the injectors, but clearly it's been pulled before. Unfortunately, with mass airflow sensors on the Z31, um, they're known to go bad. Uh, pretty common. So my guess is this is a replacement that was done at some point and didn't get put back on properly. And what I'll do, um, I will put the, a revised connector on there. I'll solder it on that has the, the wire pinched by a squeeze. Um, so I'll probably put that on there versus putting the original one on them because it's a little harder to service it if you ever need to. So, um, so yeah, we're going to pull the mass airflow out just through conversation here. And all there is to it, I'm not sure if you can see, there's just a couple 10 mils down there that holds the landing plate or the base plate for the uh, for the mass airflow. I just want to make sure that nothing's been tweaked. A lot of times people fight these. So there's a total of three, I believe. Just want to make sure I know how to count. Let me just make sure that they're all there. One, yeah, total of three. Um, top two are really easy to get to. The bottom one kind of sucks. Um, so let's get to it. Let me get a longer extension. That'll work. Okay, let's get the camera adjusted. So like I said, they're straight down. Okay, and I'll use the magnet to pick it up. Hmm, that one's kind of weirding me out. Let's get the magnet before I drop the other one. Okay, put that in the cart. So, I think the hose is causing a weird angle for there it goes. There's a clamp that, that holds the uh, low pressure line that's also used right there for the mass airflow. Okay, I'm kind of trying to drop the bolt there so I can get with the magnet. So here comes the not so fun part. This is the part I kind of don't like doing. Let's go ahead and get the hose clamps loosened. Um, the, these are three inch hose clamps for the intake piping. Or intake tubing, I guess. So we get these loose. Okay. And then that screw, that bolt, the last one, it's kind of hard to get to because it's underneath the piping. And so what I want to do is get as much as the intake piping removed so I can have a better uh, opportunity to get my hand out of there with a speed wrench. Adjusted. So what I'm feeling right now, I'm just kind of giving a good shake, is that the uh, there's a nice seal on that intake piping. Um, so in this case, let me see if I have my bent screwdriver. Here's my drawer of screwdriver rejects, also known as um, 
things I do, like a bent screwdriver for reasons like this. So I can just kind of shimmy the uh, flat blade down there to hopefully try to break that seal without breaking the, uh, the pipe. There we go. So I don't know if you can see that. All right. So kind of got it slid off there, which is good. That's what I want. And now, let me, let me go see if I can bring it up a little taller. There we go. So let me get a flashlight and show you what I got going on. So I've got the intake um, piping right there from the mass airflow. I've got it pulled up a bit. And there's a screw, I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, it's right where the flashlight's hitting. It's down there below the intake piping. And normally you can't really get to it if this is uh, in its seated position. It's kind of hard to get there. So what we're gonna do is get our handy dandy magnetic flashlight find a good spot for it kind of works ish Let's see about sorry about that I found a good spot let me just bring the light back up a bit there we go I can I can see it now Okay, so let's get my number 10 speed. Let's see if we can adjust the camera so you guys can see. Like I said, this one's kind of like the reason why I hate replacing mass airflows. This one screw, or bolt, I should say. I might be lucky after getting it loosened that I can kind of maybe get a screwdriver and go at a 45 degree approach. And these screws are like long, they're like 15 millimeters long. And I can tell you right now that this mass airflow is a reman. The, the sticker that's on the side right there is no longer there. Um, but with that said, I'm probably gonna even send it off to get um, remanned. Uh, you can't. I think you can buy them new still from Nissan, but even then they're remands. Um, but you can send these off to A1 Cardone, and they can uh, go through it and get it back to specifications if it's outside the range. It's a resistor type mass airflow. So there's a resistor inside of it. So it's actually really easy to service them. I just don't have the knowledge and equipment to do so. But the people that have sent them off to A1 Cardone, they've actually reported back saying that they're pretty good and they work well afterwards. So we'll probably do that because 99% of well, not 99. The, on these cars, there's usually like three things that cause drivability issues. Number one is, could be the mass airflow. Number two could be the cylinder head temp sensor, which is behind this pulley. Uh, three could be a really bad O2 sensor, like a closed circuit O2. Um, otherwise, like things like a bad ECU, which is unfortunately kind of getting common. ECUs are drying up in stock. But my point is, if this car had any driving issues, which it did have a bad cold start, um, if it was a bad mass airflow, let's let's get it first. Let's get it done, and not put a unknown condition mass airflow in there. 
Okay, so I got the last bolt out. And this thing is loose now, as you can see. Um, we'll go ahead and pull the whole air box out. And the reason being is that um, we're gonna replace the radiator. So it has to come out anyways. So there's just these four bolts that are holding the whole assembly in. So we get those pulled out and I'll put those screws back in their home. bother checking the condition of the air filter it's probably bad but I actually like putting those drop-in k &N filters it's serviceable I think I like to think that they provide a little bit of oomph and airflow but I think it might just be all uh, just imaginary horsepower gains all right this is cool so there is a little funnel that if you look right there, you see that mesh right there? That's a little screen mesh area. Take this as like a colder intake type of thing where air gets drafted in around the headlight bucket and that little filter cone deal pulls an air through there. Sometimes when I'm working on these cars, that cone filter thing is gone. It's just missing. Um, so I'm happy to see that it's still there. That's all I'm saying. And it's clearly Fighting me. Give me a little bit of a hard time. So what we're gonna do is give it some slack by pulling out the mass airflow. There we go. Here's the mass airflow. Looks pretty clean. It's definitely a reman. You can tell it has like it's been remanned and has aluminum colored spray paint on it. So behind that, that cap there is a manual way to adjust your idle, um, which I, they seal it off. Uh, that one's actually been accessed, you can tell. But yeah, it's been replaced. Like it's missing two of the screws on the bottom. So yeah, we'll get that sent out to get remanned. Okay, so then we pull off the other hose. This bad boy. These like never fail. These ones never fail. This one typically is cracked right there. Very surprised to see it's all one piece. That's like a shock. Like all the ones in my Z's are cracked and replaced. All right, so now that we got the room shifted a little bit. Okay, air box. And here's the little cone uh, funnel thing there. Let me put this in the pile. And one thing I'll say, guys, is it's not a race to pull a motor. Um, I mean, I could do this much faster if I wasn't recording this and going through a very uh, detail oriented. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that can pull it in like an, an hour or two, and I, I certainly can, but when you're pulling a motor, detail orientation, like of where everything is placed, where how you're pulling things about, it's like really important because so far nothing's broke. I haven't damaged one component yet, um, other than like that fuel line, which is no big deal because I'm never put the new uh, soft lines in here anyways. But yeah, so yes, I'm taking a good time, but I'm also going through it very slowly and cautiously. And my expectations for this car when it's done, it's gonna be, you know, a restored Shiro. So, you know, some of the parts cars I bought over the years to pull a turbo motor or like a diff or, you know, a transmission, like, yeah, you bet I'll pull it quick if I don't care about it. So, like I said earlier, you can, uh, tilt the motor like I just shifted a little bit um, easiest way to do it is get a uh, 
floor jack on the oil pan. And that way you can kind of bump it up a little bit and push it forward. So. See if you guys can capture that. All right. So, got it on the oil pan, on the sump. And watch this, I'm gonna pump, and you can see the motor, it'll tilt. All right, you see that? So now, check that out. I can easily get back there and get to that hose. But it is, that hose clamp is, it's like, I'm guessing the intake was pulled off at one point, probably for the fuel injector campaign, which involves replacing the, uh, the fuel injector um, rails. The, when they had the intake off, they must have messed with the, uh, um, that hose back there for the heater line because the screw is like, is pointed underneath the intake. So I can't even get a screwdriver. Um, I'll probably be able to get it with a speed wrench, but I, I can't attack it like I normally do. So where's my number eight? Let's see if I can get behind it from over here. It's kind of frustrating. Worst case is I just snip it off because these are gonna get replaced anyways. Yeah, it's, it's going, I got it. Kind of frustrating. Sorry if I have to adjust the camera. It's not how they usually are. Usually these screws are for the clamp is like up and down, straight up and down. So I can usually just get it with a Phillips screwdriver because they're usually not that tight. enough all right so can you see that let's get the camera so it's uh right there i don't know if you can see it the bad lighting but let me get my phillips and we'll just kind of go at it real nice and quick here But still, much easier than scraping your arms and hands and wrists by fighting underneath the intake. Got it just about off, there it goes. Okay, so let's get the hose pliers here. See if I can get a. I have to go swing around the other side. Sorry if you can't see. Let's get that adjusted. Yeah, this one's kind of difficult to loosen because it's just in a bad spot. All right. I think I got it. Yep. Okay, so that one's loose and off. So what's left to do before we actually physically pull the motor out, we have to get the two lines for the power steering raise up a bit and get the alternator harness, the charge harness loosened or removed, and then uh, any intake and uh, other miscellaneous vacuum lines going underneath the uh, AC compressor. And then we're done for tonight because we're about there. And yeah, we're looking, we're looking pretty good otherwise. Cool. 
So let's get the motor loosened with the uh, floor jack there. And what I'll do is I'll kind of put the motor back in its normal position. Um, and I might actually put it back up, tilt it more, and I'll show you why, or I'll tell you why. There's a um, the factory hookup for the motor removal. Unfortunately, this one's gone. I have it on my test block, but there's normally a hook right here. So my guess is at some point someone replaced the power steering and didn't put the uh, the hook for the engine removal as one on the other side. So you, you know you usually have a chain going across this, the top center there. Um, no big deal. We really, there are other ways to pull the motor, but uh, let's go ahead and get this pulled off. I believe that bolt for the banjo bolt is either a 22 or 24. I think it's a 24. Um, let me try a 22 first. Yeah, we'll try a 22. But my guess is it's 24. Yeah, 24. And unfortunately, through my move, I lost some of my tools. Um, so no big deal, I'll just put a socket on there. Bum, bum, bum. thinking out loud right now about how I want to go about doing it. I'm going to try a half inch swivel on there. I have low expectations. Actually. The problem is with the angle there, it's like hard to get to that banjo bolt because of the reservoir if you can see that um, sometimes I actually just remove the reservoir altogether um, but it looks like I should get on there right now so that's good um, so that's gonna be pretty easy just to get pulled off where's my half drive Kind of fought me on that one. You know what? We're just gonna get a adjustable crescent. They're usually not on there that tight, and I don't mind it this way. Yes, it's not the right way. I'd rather have a 24 box wrench and do it, but this is just as fine. Man, that is on there. Definitely tell you it's been replaced. That's never that tight. Do a good couple. I'm a little shocked right now about how tight that is. Wowza, that thing's on there. All right, we have to do, we have to do socket on that at this point. So what we'll do is lower the motor a tad and get a, right there. So what I did is I lowered it to get the, the banjo bolt kind of in line with this opportunity for a socket to go on there. Not happy to see that's on there that tight, but it is what it is. And I'm gonna try to do without without a universal. Oh yeah, that's good. Here we go. Holy smokes. Holy smokes, that's on there. Time to get a cheater bar. <laughs> I like to use my other floor jack. Okay. That is on there.
got it. I cannot believe that. That was on there super tight. So if we're talking about parts that normally fail, this is the high pressure line to the power steering. And normally it starts to sweat and uh, bleed. But check this out. This is kind of disappointing right now. Previous owner doesn't know what power steering is for a uh, import car. That is power steering fluid for like, for like a domestic. That is not the red fluid that you should be seeing. Yeah, yeah it is. Man, that sucks because I have to now purge it and possibly be looking at replacing the rack because of that. That's not that's not cool at all. All right, so unfortunately that's gonna drip a little bit. Put the banjo bolt back in its home temporarily. One of the crush washers dropped, but no big deal. You just get new ones. Never, never really want to use a, um, reuse a crush washer. Paper towels. So there's one more line. That's the feed line from the reservoir. It's literally right below it. So excuse me, Mr. Line. And you can tell this is what happens when you have incorrect line. This thing has been sweating and it's all covered in grit and grime. And it's leaking down below, which is fine. So I'm just gonna grab a Phillips and go for that clamp. All right. Yeah, usually these aren't on very tight. This hose is like super hardened and plasticky, just like the uh, brake booster line was. Man, that's on there good. Yeah, this line needs to be replaced. What's cool is you can get aftermarket, or there's a, you can get silicone lines. that'll definitely beat the original rubber lines for sure. All right, so like I said, that line is pretty much seized on there. Where are those other pliers I was using? Oh yeah, they're over there. Got my shop cat hanging out with me. You know, there's a way, I have a vacuum um, siphon that I could use to pull all the fluid out, but I want it to drain. I want it out of the reservoir. This is not cool seeing GM, or not GM, I assume it's GM, but domestic power steering fluid in a Japanese car. It's supposed to be ATF, automatic transmission fluid. Okay. I would just scoot on past it. All right, so we got the both the AC compressor, we got the power steering lines disconnected. All that's left to do are are the electrical for the alternator and whatever is uh, miscellaneous vacuum lines are over there, and then the whole thing is out, ready to go. And I have an engine stand, an old one, one of my first, sitting over there by the door, waiting for it. Um, so I mentioned earlier that there's supposed to be a big bracket here that has a loop on it. 
that is used to pull the motor and behind the head on the driver's side there's supposed to be one too and it, it's on there i can you necessarily can't feel it but i can or you can't see it but i can feel it so um what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and uh pause the video i'm going to go get, locate my uh, spare brackets and put it on as if i you know they should be original to the motor and i'll get the chain hooked up to it so we can pull the motor out uh, so i'll be right back all right we're back so it took me a little while to find a workable solution um, i assume my spare uh, engine uh, lift points are in my shed in a box somewhere um, i happen to have a vg33 unit that was in my shop so this is off of an xterra this bracket um, it'll work it's essentially the same thing just looks a little bit different uh, so a little tip, tip and trick here is, you know, these valve covers, they actually look really good. Um, one of the concerns I have with restorations is whether or not the valve covers need to be repowder coated. These ones don't, they look really good. So we'll, I mean, I'll make that determination once I pull it all the way, like tear down the motor. But for now I want to, I want to safeguard it. So what I do is I have my old welding gloves. Um, so what I do is I just kind of put it like that as kind of a buffer. You can see that. So that when the chain gets pulled, it'll uh, have a thick leather glove to buffer it. You can even use like cardboard, a couple folds of cardboard. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a point in the back of the motor that also has an engine uh, pickup point. Flashlights drive me insane. So if you look, it's down there. It's where the uh, O2 sensor connector uh, clips onto and mounts. Um, it's a thick bracket, so I put a, a nut and bolt through a chain. So here's the chain situation. Um, so the same thing kind of applies, even though there's nothing to color um, damage, I guess, in terms of like, you know, red or whatnot. Um, I do want to protect things, right? Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'll just get this leather glove from my welding, my old leather gloves, and I'll just kind of put it there. The only thing you need to look out for is the um, the nipple there for the brake booster vacuum port. So just kind of make sure the chain is on one side of it and not to hit it because I've accidentally in the past have basically crushed it before and had to replace that. Okay, so we're ready to go. Um, I got the engine hoist here assembled, and so let's go ahead and lower that down. Right about there is good. I just looked under the car a minute ago, and there is quite the uh, oil spill from that power steering fluid, but I'll clean it up later after this engine pull. All right, so I got the chain hooked up. Um, Yes, you can have the leveling uh, situation. I do have one in the shed. I really never use it. I use the chain links to kind of level it out. And really, you just use some MAN, some manpower, and you just kind of tilt the motor where you need to go. And the chain links are what you kind of, are what hold it. So like, that's only with it really when you like need to pull them, or not pull the motor, when you put the motor in, um, whether or not you're going at an angle, you rely on the chain links to uh situate that but i mean by all means if you want to use a leveler be my guest i just find them kind of annoying so and as i mentioned earlier we're just gonna uh raise the motor about halfway out so that we can um get to the alternator charging harness and remove any other miscellaneous vacuum lines so you see how I just did that? I just moved the, the pickup point more centered on the chains and the chain links hold the kind of like where you placed it. All right, here we go. Now, just a little note here. Um, Sometimes when you're pulling the motor, the, the fan blades might get in the way of the cross member there in the front and the crossbar. 
Um, I might remove it here in a minute. I might not, um, but we'll see how it goes. And I just noticed I forgot to undo one thing here, and it is the the air pump for the uh, cat. There. There's another line there feeding into the pipe. There's a pipe, a hard pipe that runs underneath and connects down below. So let's just uh, get that unhooked. No big deal. And that's why I said earlier, it's like, it's not a race to pull a motor and take your time, do things right versus, you know, half-assing it or going through uh, quickly. Cause you know, if you're trying to compete on trying to pull things out quickly, you're, you're likely just going to damage stuff and get all mad at yourself and you'll have to find different go source parts that you broke and whatnot. It's just best to take your time. So no big deal. So you heard the little crack there of the line seal. Okay. So I got that one off. So like I said a minute ago, th those fine, those uh, fan blades might need to come off. Um, but if we can just pull straight up, we'll be good. That's what my goal is. Um, when you're pulling the motor with the transmission, which you can do, I really don't recommend it because it's a weird, like pull everything out in a weird angle. The shifter of the transmission can scratch the uh, tunnel and the firewall. It's kind of like a, just a hazardous way of doing it. If it's a parts car, be my guest, pull it out in any shape or form you want to. But in this situation where I'm trying to be a little more cautious with how I'm doing things, I don't recommend pulling the motor out with the transmission. It's just not my style, I guess. All right, so what I'm doing right now is I know what the situation is over there by the power steering. Like there's underneath, there's a charging harness for the alternator. There's plenty of slack. So we're just gonna carefully raise it up. But over here on this side, you got these hardened, very stiff rubber AC lines. So while I'm pumping, I'm gonna hold it out of the way. Everything's kind of out just as expected. Let me get the camera just so you guys can see. Okay, so let's pause right here. Let's get the flashlight. Let's take another inventory here of what's going on. All right, so this vacuum line. So there's that zip tie I was talking about right there. Um, you can actually like retain these zip ties if you care to. I, I don't care for them because at this point in age, they are brittle and they're likely just gonna fall apart. So let's go ahead and snip it. Let's get rid of these old vacuum lines. Or, I'm sorry, uh, zip ties. All right, so these vacuum lines, there's one more zip tie straight down there. snip it okay and that is going to the intake pipe the s pipe as they're called and so to get that bad boy off just a pair of needle nose pliers for the spring clamp otherwise this is all the vacuum lines separated i'm just double checking and we got to get this uh isolating ground wire pulled out of the way it's kind of jammed in there there we go all right so like i said one last uh hose clamp there Twisted, the connector is. Again, I'm not even sure why I'm trying to save this because um, I'm going to replace all these vacuum lines. Just, I guess, old habit of doing things. 
the proper way, I suppose. Okay, got it off. All right. So I believe that's the last vacuum line relating to the side of the motor. Cool. So that's good to go down there. Let's go check to see how the charging harness, if I can access it yet. Not quite. Let's check the tension. Got plenty of slack on the charge harness. We can go a bit more. Okay, everything's looking good. Let's keep pumping it. Almost out. And what I'm watching right now while I'm pumping it, I'm just keeping an eye on that fan. It's got about two and a half, maybe three inches. Um, little heat shield that was catching. Cool. So we're looking pretty clear over here on a good note. Just double checking things. Okay. You know, on an engine hoist, like if you look at the angle, the articulating angle where you pull the motor out, it's gonna go up and the motor is gonna come closer. So as I'm pumping, I'm watching the fan because it will get close to that cross member, but we got plenty of space. I'm just watching the harness over here. Everything's looking good. Yeah, let's go check out the charging harness. Almost there. And again, we've got plenty of slack. So I'm not pulling or stretching any wire. We're looking pretty good. Okay, let's make sure everything's clear. Looking good. Doing one last double check over here. So 100% sure this side is clear, 100%. And all that's left is just that alternator charging harness, which we are just about there, I can see it. A Couple more pumps and I'll go ahead and unbolt it. All right. So likely I'll need a 12, unless it's been replaced, which I'll um, grab a 10 as well for the ground bolt that might be there and let me grab a 13 because if it's an aftermarket alternator there's a chance that the 13 might be uh, the nut for the alternator post and then lastly I'm happy to see this check this out let me get my flashlight so there is a little uh, this bracket here um, that holds the charge harness in place. Um, usually I see these missing. Um, they're just gone for whatever reason. So I'm really happy to see that it's still there. Um, so that makes me feel all, all sorts of good. Let me uh, disconnect the post for the low pressure port um, for the, before I damage the wires. Um, this is all getting replaced anyway. So like normally what I do is I'll drop the motor mount and clear that out of the way, but if that gets damaged, I'm, I'm fine with that just because it needs to get replaced. Um, I can tell right now just by alternator, or not the alternator, the uh, motor mount is leaking. These are uh, liquid filled isolator mounts to further reduce vibration. And it's very common that they uh, disintegrate over the years. So if you're looking down there, we got the voltage regulator um connector which will see if i can get that disconnected usually they're kind of hard because it's so insulated with the uh, isolator in the connector um, because they want to make sure that it's kept dry i kind of got it loose a little bit but let me get some needle nose pliers to finish it off just kind of give it some motivation to get on out of there. There it goes. 
Nice and easy. Didn't break a thing. All right. So this is the original alternator from 1988. Never been replaced. That's kind of cool to see. All right, like I said, usually I wear like a, head, a headlamp, which I should have put on a long time ago, but whatever. Come on, man. It's kind of fighting me a little bit. It looks like the, uh, the eyelet there is kind of tweaked. Is that a 12? Usually they're 12. Maybe it's a 10. I guess it's a 10. My mistake. I'm so used to the, the Titan alternators because I always uh, recommend putting in a Nissan Titan alternator. It's almost a drop-in scenario you have to get a different bracket but the stock alternator is only 70 amps and uh, the nissan titan alternator ranges from 135 to 165 amps and in my opinion the 70 amp alternator is just not enough even for like a factory situation like you'll see the uh fighting me um you'll see like the light the headlights will dim um or the alternator needle will drop on the voltage when you turn the headlights on just that's uh that's pretty much rusted and seized on there so what i'm going to do um because i am probably going to put the nissan titan alternator in here um this connector will end up being replaced anyways. I might just consider snipping it. But before I do that, let me, uh, let me get the uh, ground wire off and see if it gives me a little bit of room. But I can feel, even when I got a full wrench on it, it's, it's starting to strip. Um, it looks nasty as far as age. The ground's coming off good. You know, I'm, and I'm looking at the uh, the valve cover. That needs to be repowder coated. It's got scratches all over it. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. All right, so we got the ground out of the way. Maybe that'll give me a little more room. But I'm telling you that that's likely gonna need to be replaced because it's not wanting to come off. Just try to put an antenna on there again. Old habits. That's spinning. It's. Did I get it? No, it's like completely rounded. This nut is. Looking good, guys. Let me get the uh, a six point, a six point ten. That'll help me in this scenario. A six point ten. Maybe that'll get a firmer bite on it. Felt a little looser.
Oh, and then after the uh, alternator, we'll need to undo the the prehistoric knock sensor that it, that doesn't do anything on these cars. It's kind of a joke. I've never seen a alternator uh, terminal stud there post like that um, get so rested. Hi guys. It's a joke at this point. It's coming off. Man, this is definitely the original alternator. And this guy had like a aftermarket sound system and a subwoofer. How in the world did this alternator provide enough of a voltage supply and draw demand for a sound system? It's beyond me. Let's try again. It's kind of fighting me. Should have just cut it a while ago because when doing the Titan alternator swap, you have to put a bigger power lead on there, anyways. But I guess I'm just being anal right now. All right. There goes my patience. I'm going to snip it. It's all frayed and it's rusted anyways. There's no point in trying to save that. This flashlight. It's giving me a run for my money. So before I touch it, I want to make sure that the uh, battery is truly disconnected. Because I was about to shock myself. And uh, yeah, like I said, I'm gonna replace the wiring here anyways. As this one is like all sorts of aged and... All right, so it's been snipped. Okay, all right, that was longer than it really needed to be. All that's left to do at this point is remove the, the, the motor mount stud there in the middle that's holding the bracket. And this will all come loose. And you can still get um, motor mounts, not from factory. Um, you can get Z32 mounts. And I saw online that some of those Z32 mounts are single stud. Maybe it was just a bad picture. Um, but the brand uh, Pioneer, I'm gonna drop the motor mount. The brand Pioneer is an aftermarket supplier of parts and stuff. Um, they make a suitable OEM type replacement that's still hydraulically filled um, motor mount. So um, I'm gonna show you how to properly disconnect the uh, knock sensor, it's really weird. And what's funny is on the, the knock sensor is actually made by Mitsubishi. Just cool seeing different suppliers of tech. And that chain is kind of too long for my standards. I'm worried about the hood contacting the chain. All right, so what you do is there's a boot there holding the knock sensor in, right? You see the boot? So you pull the boot off like so. And 
the connector, if you can see, is that white connector, which like kind of encapsulates the green-ish of the sensor. And if it's still pliable, you just squeeze and pull the white thing and it all comes out, which it feels like it will. Otherwise, you have to get a pick and fight it. Which it kind of feels like it's gonna wanna fight me. No, it's kind of loose. Like it came off a little bit. It's kind of being a little stubborn. Come on, guy. Sorry, guys. It's one of those things fighting me. There it goes. All right, so if you look at it, it's just a single spade wire. Um, and you're you're squeezing, like, you know, like on a pill container you get for your prescription, it has those child locks. It's kind of like the same thing where when you squeeze it, it releases the locks on the side. And there's the sensor. Um, I'll pull it out here and show you. But again, I'm kind of getting worried about the chain length here. You can see up there, I got too much slack. Um, so with that said, I might have the ability to pull. Yeah, I should be all right. But usually I don't have that much chain slack. But what we're gonna do is kind of pull a little my way. All right, pull it my way a little bit. All right, gain me about three inches over there. Pull up, crank it up. Make sure you guys can see okay. I'm keeping an eye on both the hood and the fan blades. At this point, I care more about the hood than I do the fan blades. All right. Doing one last look. We're fine with the hood and fine with the blades of the fan. All right, she's out. Just kind of pull it out a little bit. There we go. So there it is. That's like the best way I think of pulling the motor out. That's not like taking a bunch of parts off and whatnot. Um, disappointing about the uh, power steering, like I said. Previously, I put power steering fluid in. That's just not right. It needs to be ATF. All right. So that's going to be it for tonight. Um, I need to put this on an engine stand. So we'll do an inspection of the motor. But like I said, it was clearly evident that the uh, rear main was leaking pretty good. I can't remember if the front seal was leaking as well. Um, valve covers were definitely leaking at some point. You can see a lot of sludge build up there. And you see what I was talking about here? Like the chain is on the inside of the um, brake booster port and uh the glove is protecting it so that's all good but yeah i mean it's i doubt this motor's been pulled it doesn't look like it if it has it's probably done by the dealership and they did a good job okie dokie let's pull it out A piece of wood and we're just gonna set it down on the ground here first always good to have spare pieces of wood lying around and what you got to do basically is when you drop it down you want to have like the right amount of wood to make up like the 
the oil pan sump there. You see that? So like, I got a four by four or, yeah, we'll do, we'll do it like that. Hey, actually, just the four by four is good. And matter of fact, I see the one I've used for years. Actually, I forgot I brought that with me all the way from Colorado, my old one. Check this out. This thing has seen a lot of motors. It's covered in oil. Check this out. All right. So go ahead and put that right there and we'll lower it down. Slow it down a little bit. Okay. Let's go ahead and push the piece of wood. There we go. Like I said, I'll get the uh, motor on the engine stand probably tomorrow. But for now, we'll just have it rest on it. All right, well, there it is. Um, nothing broke other than I think the fuel line, the soft rubber kind of cracked and I purposely broke the booster hose because it's just to show that they get brittle over the years. Um, but I, again, guys, I want to show like the importance of like taking your time and do things like very slow and methodically, because if you kind of rush it, you're going to, you're going to have problems for sure. Um, and you'll be kind of hating life, you know, later about that. So, and I didn't see that re that uh, injector retainer. I was talking about that spring clip. So let me go grab that real quick before I forget about it. I still have one left. That was on the magnet over here. All right. So I see it just where I thought it was. There's the other one. I'm gonna just put it with the other guy. So we got all six injector uh, spring clips, or retainer clips. And yeah, the motor, it's looking good. Um, we're gonna do a compression test on it when it's on the stand. You just hook up an alternator. Um, and I'll say right now, guys, to do a compression test properly per the factory service manual or any service manual for that matter, you gotta remove all six plugs and then have the throttle body open 100%, and then you do a compression test. You don't wanna do like one plug at a time, like have plugs installed still because it gives you false readings. Um, so to get true compression on a cold motor or even hot motor, have all six plugs removed and have the throttle body open 100%, and you'll get your true compression result test. So I could have easily done that in the car, but why fight that when you can just, uh, just do it on the engine stand, hook up the starter, do the flywheel, you know. So that's how we're gonna do it. Um, so that'll make the determination of whether or not this motor gets rebuilt or just simply resealed. Um, I will put it, my boroscope inside to take a look at the crank and if there's a lot of sludge buildup, if there's glitter, uh, insinuating that the bearings are kind of worn, then I'll, I'll make that call as well. But the Z31 VG30 bearings are, are really stout um, two layer uh, bearing. Um, they're um, really uh, hard bearings. They take a beating. Matter of fact, Z32 guys will go to the Z31 bearings because they're, they're harder than the softer Z32 bearings. Um, I don't know if they do that anymore these days since like King racing bearings or like the bees knees with engine performance bearings, but um, but my point is there's a good chance this motor, even having the hundred plus thousand miles, it's uh, probably a good motor provided that the, um, the compression is good. But like I said, if the compressions come back a little weaker, then we'll have to get the motor rebuilt with new rings and bearings, um, which is fine. It's no big deal. Um, 
a matter of fact, even though I'm living here in Nashville, Tennessee, I will ship the motor to my machinist in Colorado and Denver because I trust him that much to do, to, uh, to do a build and rebuild properly. Um, he built the motor in the wide body, the VK56. He built the motor in my Black 89 over there, the VG33. And then he uh, rebuilt the motor in the turbocharged Xterra over here. Um, I blew the head gaskets in this motor when I was first turbocharged it and then washed the cylinder walls, which um, uh, on two cylinder walls, it kind of screwed up the, the bore. So it needed to be going, uh, gone out by 20 thou. So he redid that. And, but my point is like his engine building uh, skill set is outstanding and I trust him hundred percent. So if we need to send this motor out to get rebuilt, I will definitely send it to Colorado because like a $150, $200 shipping charge or whatever it may be, maybe 300, I have no idea what it is these days. It's worth it for the right engine builder to do it. I have a relationship with him. I've been his customer for, I don't know, almost 10 years now. Um, he's built my other friend's motors. I just trust him. It's not a slam against anyone in Nashville. It's just that I have an existing relationship as a customer with this machinist. Um, and by the way, his, his machine shop name is DC Racing Motors in, in Denver, Colorado. Um, I swear to you, he is the guy, 100%. LS, Coyote, VG, VK, any motor, he'll build it. He knows what he's doing. His name is Ricky. Um, he's like the top, in my opinion. But anyways, we'll get to that point later. Um, just taking a quick here look here at the engine bay. It's dirty. It's nasty. And we got some uh, paint that came off, uh, most likely from a leaking brake master or not putting in fluid properly. But overall, I'm very happy to see that most of everything is exactly how it should have been back in the 80s. And uh, what were our next steps are gonna be for this car at the very next uh, point in time is I'm gonna go ahead and pull all the trimming off the car, all the miscellaneous components, and then take all the interior or the engine bay items that can be pulled out, I'll remove them. Um, otherwise, everything else would be kind of like um, squished in the middle uh, so that we can paint the engine bay over again and uh, give this car a proper makeover and look, get it looking like it should be. And then from there, it's just doing the suspension, bushings, getting the interior redone, pull the dash out, get vacuum hoses replaced, and get this car put back together as it should be. But that's it for tonight, guys. Uh, appreciate you guys hanging in there with me on this long video. Uh, these series will definitely be like parts one, two, and three, five, whatever. I don't really feel like fast forwarding the videos and making things like a zip through uh, type of how-to video. The point of me talking through these videos and, and demonstrating how I do things is for you to learn. If you do the fast forward video of like me speed wrenching a, a bull tad or something like that, it's like, okay, you get the idea, I understand that, but some of the, the pointers I'm giving to you, you might wanna listen and learn um, and you're welcome to fast forward the video yourself. I'm not gonna do that through a video editing software, but um, so yeah, these videos will be long and, and kind of drawn out. But again, it's to teach those who haven't pulled it tips and tricks of how I do it. And if you notice, like I said earlier, the hood didn't come out, right? It's, it's, it's there as it was. And uh, you just have to reposition those hood struts for it to come out and like that, so. Anyways, um, I'm going to call it night, guys. I appreciate you guys uh, staying in there with me through the, this uh, long process. But as always, please like and subscribe. I appreciate it. I'm trying to do better Z31 related videos. Um, I don't know what else more to say. Um, if nothing else, guys, have a good night. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to get the motor here onto the engine stand and i thought it might be worthwhile just to show how i do it i don't think it's rocket science it's pretty easy for anyone to put in a motor on an engine stand uh but in the doing so i want to show the removal of the clutch flywheel and then you know together we're going to review the condition of it to see if it is truly the original you know it could have been replaced by nissan at some point which i really think it has been replaced by nissan with a nissan actual clutch and uh, flywheel i'm sorry clutch and uh, pressure plate kit and the reason why I think so is there's enough evidence to suggest that the transmission has been dropped, the wire clips have been broken, and there's just other tidbits I can tell that the, the uh, transmission has been dropped. 
So anyways, um, I'll go ahead and uh, get this onto the engine stand. It's already sitting behind it. Uh, one of these, um, one of the tools I'm going to use is a, uh, the clutch insulation tool. Um, you want to use that as also the removal tool as well. Now check this out. So this right here, this is a uh, clutch alignment tool that is for uh, LS transmissions. Um, it looks like a real input shaft and it's actually not. It's actually a real nice alignment tool. Um, I had to buy this versus using the plastic ones uh, because the tolerances on the plastic are so just loosey-goosey and not accurate that with the three disc clutches I have in both my wide body and my black 89, um, they both use the same triple disc clutch. I could not get a perfect alignment even using the uh, black plastic tool. So this like really made a huge difference. And I thought, man, that was so great. I want one for Nissan uh, spline clutches as well. So what I did is I had a old broken transmission and uh, I went ahead and cut off the input um, shaft here and there it is, that's my clutch alignment tool. So we'll use this to put into the rear of the motor here. And that way when I go to remove it, the, the clutch is not just dropped to the floor. I wanna be able to review it uh, as it, you know, in one piece. So um, let's go ahead and get the, the flywheel, I'm sorry, the pressure plate dropped. And that is a 12, millimeter sockets which all my tools are still kind of in a disarrayment i gotta get some things tidied up here for sure and yeah we'll just go ahead and use a six point deep socket that should do it let's get the camera adjusted all right And I usually save the last bolt for last, the top bolt for last. Just the camera a bit. There we go. And these are the original pressure plate bolts. You can tell they have a, the head of the bolt is deeper than it has a flange base to it. So this, these are in fact the original bolts for the pressure plate and clutch. All right, so I wanna save those. Those are in really good condition, so a little filthy is all. All right, got that top one, and I just, like I said, I use that one last, I can just catch it, you know. All right, so it'll stay. It has those uh, dowel pins in there. All right, so we'll just go ahead and gently pull it off. Did I miss one? No, it's all there. All right. So looking at it, we got some hot spots. Looks like some chatter going on. You can definitely see that in the video, but overall it looks all right. Um, I mean, there's no point in reusing this obviously, but overall just inspect, inspecting it. Um, so let's get the clutch out. So the clutch is organic material, which is factory. Um, not much clutch life left. I mean, there's a bit, it's like 50% worn. Um, but what I, one thing I just caught my eye, where was it? Yeah, right here on the outer edge. Um, it's wearing down quicker on the outer edge for sure. And generally what that means is that the flywheel has been either the flywheel or the pressure plate. And I think in this case, it was the, uh, the pressure plate was not, you know, for whatever reason it wasn't flat and it could have been caused by uh, heat fluctuations like riding the clutch too much. Um, so it is what it is. Flywheel is in incredible shape. So all we need to do in the flywheel is just get it turned. I don't see any concerns of heat damage at all. Um, so let's get this pulled out of the way real quick. This old pressure plate and clutch and disc. It's kind of cool seeing the originals or factory replacements. I don't think this is the original. There's just no way with the mileage that's on the car that it would be the original. But you never know, I suppose. All right, and I'll put my 
clutch alignment tool back. I like this better than the plastic ones, that's for sure. Okay, um, that's a 14 for the flywheel bolts. Now here is something I wanna stress the importance of, and that is never ever use a 12 point socket on a flywheel bolt. Um, because these uh, bolts on the flywheel are very uh, shallow head bolts. And uh, unless you gotta, you gotta get a good grip via socket, and if you don't, it'll, uh, it'll round the heads off pretty quickly. And it makes life incredibly hard to get them off when they're rounded off. So, um, like I use these, these are just Harbor Freight impact sockets, but these have a really tight tolerance for the reason. I really like these. They, they have a really good bite to them. Um, so we're going to use this to get these off. So let's get that angled up on the camera. And I'll pull one out and show you how shallow the head is on these flywheel bolts. So, so look at that. I mean, like that's not much meat. I mean, it's, if anything, it's normal ish, but it's not very deep. Right. So, um, don't use a 12 point, be sure to use a six point on there. So we go ahead and buzz all those off. And the boss ring should hold the, uh, the flywheel so it doesn't drop immediately. And I'll show you what the boss ring is. It's part of the crank. So I'll go ahead and pull that off, just shimmy it back and forth. Man, it's, it's caked in oil in the back. That rear main is nasty. And actually, <laughs> I can see what's going on. So check this out. I grab a flashlight. So we got rear main problems, but I, it looks like the rear main had been replaced, um, but it's not like, I, I probably can't tell in the, in the video here, but it's not uh, like flatly seated, right? It's kind of at the top is sitting out more than the bottom. And then additionally, you got those lip seals down here. And this is original, like this has never been removed. That's the original RTV, but the lip seals leaking, and that's just a normal thing. There's so much oil coming off from that area. That's kind of concerning actually. So much oil and so much grime that the inspection plate did not get dropped with the transmission. Usually that comes flying out. And here's the, uh, the uh, bell housing shin plate. Got a little evidence of a, of a mouse. A little messed up there, but we'll clean that out. Yeah, lots of uh, grime back there. But, okay, so like I said earlier, we're gonna use the starter to do a compression test, not today, maybe the next day, but we're gonna keep this bracket on and it's a current alignment because we know the alignment's good for that. So we'll, we'll do that later. Um, let me get the, the plates and the flywheel into the pile of old parts. And then we're gonna hook up the motor to the engine stand. All right, so normally I see a lot of people uh, using the transmission bolts to mount the you know, to place the motor on the engine stand. And yes, it works. I, I tend not to recommend that because um, you risk the chance of damaging your transmission bolts. I'm gonna use the transmission bolts today only because I'm gonna buy new ones. I put new ones on there, so I don't really care about these. But if anything, maybe run down to Home Depot or you know Ace Hardware or something like that and get your uh, spare transmission bolts just for the um, engine stand. And I, I do have some, I just have no idea where they're at since having moved fairly recently. 
Okay, so like I said, we're gonna use the factory bolts here. And what I normally do, let's get that camera adjusted. I use the top center ones for the two of the arms. My only concern about using factory bolts is sometimes you have too much thread engagement, which is 100% the case right now. So I might have to get some washers to shim it out. I, that's why I really don't like using transmission bolts. It's just kind of a not so professional way of doing it. But let me grab some more washers. I'll be right back. Okay, got some washers. So I stacked four washers. Again, it's not like the best way of doing this. I'd rather have the Home Depot run of bolts to use, but this will work for now since I'm gonna be replacing these anyways. All right. So let's get those going. Got one on there. Kind of hard to grab bolts in a bag with gloves on. Okay, next up. And like I said, I use uh, the top center bolts for the engine stand. So you don't wanna tighten them all the way until you're ready to, because you need to make sure that the, the bracket is squared up and even so like right now you can tell it's all lopsided but that's okay so we got a my previous motor that was on here was a vh45 so i need to make some minor adjustments on here okay looks pretty good so, like I said, you want to get things kind of even in terms of the overall span of the arms. That way the motor sits pretty much center on the stand. Otherwise, it might be out of balance when you try to turn it and you don't want the motor being in any sort of awful, weird positioning. And I just use an adjustable wrench to tighten these down. Okay, looks pretty good. Let's get some bolts in there. All right. This guy over here. And so this guy is different because this is a pass-through bolt. So the bolt normally goes from the frontwards backwards into the uh, bell housing of the transmission. So I just have a longer bolt here that I use to go all the way through. And let me get a washer on that. Just one on each side of it. All right. Just like that. That'll work for sure. Okay, so let's get those tightened down. I, I like the alignment centering there. So you don't need to go crazy on it as far as tightness. You just gotta kind of cinch it up. So we'll just kind of buzz it. That should be good enough. And this guy, um, We'll just hand tighten that one. I believe it's a 17 and a 14. Okay, that's on there. 
And last but not least, let's get the um, crescent wrench on there to tighten the these uh, other guys. Like I said, you don't need to go crazy on these. Just you just don't want it to spin out of the way. All right, there's that guy. Let's get behind there and get the last one. good last one to go all right so it's ready to go on so if you notice the uh, the motor is hanging slightly higher then the engine stand, let me show you that. So the motor should be sitting a little higher. And the idea is you don't want to walk the motor onto the stand. You just want to lift up the stand and put it on the, uh, the motor, right? So and if anything, the motor needs to be raised a little higher. So let's do that real quick. Because you're, you're looking at like articulating angles. And it should have gone a little higher even. Let's lift it from the bottom. Come on. Yeah, let's go a little higher. Work smarter and not harder. All right, that'll do it. That'll finish it off. Maybe. There it goes. Okay, and then I get the uh, your lock pin right there, and then your uh, your bar. I've had this. This is my first engine stand from when I was uh, 18. It's seen. It's been around the block and seen a lot of motors. I actually have my VK56 on this one too. Okay, so it's ready to be placed down. Come on. Let's take a look there. Okay, easy does it. All right, let's go ahead and Get this guy out of the way. Okay. Um, so now's a good opportunity to get the chains off of the motor. So here's the, let's kneel down here so you can see. Here's the chain and nut and bolt situation. It's a very thick bracket. The bracket looks to be like a quarter inch thick. And then I just gotta pull the bolt out and we're good to reuse it for another day. So I'll just put it kind of back. Okay. 
it. And then let's go get the other one, which is a simple hook. All right. So again, I'm gonna tear down the motor um, and inspect everything. Like I wanna pull off the exhaust and see if we have any broken exhaust studs, which I'm sure we do. Um, happy to see the shields that are on there, but look, you got, you got missing uh, shield bolts there. It was weird they didn't break. They must have, I'm guessing, vibrated out. But I'm gonna get these sandblasted and then re-hit with some paint, some high temp paint. Hopefully those will It'll hold, but there's the motor on the stand ready for next steps. So, all right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and kill it. Uh, this will mark the conclusion of the motor pole for the wide body. Um, I think from here, I'll go ahead and get this video onto the internets, interwebs, and uh, for your enjoying enjoyment, watching how to videos and whatnot. But um, I think, like I said the other night, is I'll next be working on collapsing the in 